Well, good afternoon and welcome to St Edmund's Church, Creek Howell. On Sunday, the 11th of August, 1303, the Bishop of St David's, David Martin, authorised the creation of a parish for the then comparatively new town of Creek Howell. Its church was to be dedicated to St Edmund, King and Martyr. And today's lecture is part of our celebrating St Edmund's Day, which was yesterday. This King Edmund reigned in East Anglia and much of his activity lay in defending his people against the invading Danes. And in the year 969, when he was about 28, he died at the hands of the invaders because he refused to renounce his Christian faith. There are about 70 churches in the UK dedicated to this St Edmund, but this is the only one in Wales. Like everything about St Edmund, there's lots of speculation as to why we should have had this dedication. Clearly it pleased the bishop. He appended De Edmundo to his name, perhaps suggesting that he came from St Edmund, Edmund's in uh, Bury St Edmund's. However, dedicating this church in this way may also have appealed to the King of England, Edward I. He had ordered the fortification of Crickhowell Castle as part of his campaign of subduing the Welsh. I think the significance of having an English saint, and indeed someone who had become the patron saint of England, may well have been about letting it be known that the English had arrived. Politics may well have been a significant factor in making Edmund king and martyr patron saint of Crick Howell Parish. But whatever the reasons for the dedication, today we celebrate the grace given to that young man to stand firm for Christ and to live and die for him. A very warm welcome to you all to this webinar. I won't say good afternoon, though it is good afternoon here in Wales, but some of you may have just finished your supper or may be getting ready for the breakfast. I'm aware that we have a wide range of people joining us from everywhere. Therefore, I would rather say Shalom Olechem, a very Christian thing which Christian used to greet one another. Peace be with you. The world we live in is facing a severe political crisis. The challenges related to ecology, authoritarian nationalism, militancy, terror, and many other raise the urgency of political wisdom. Christian faiths can build a more just and peaceful world by renewing our politics. You may notice at the bottom we have Q and A, a little icon in the bar. If you have any questions that you would like to ask after or during the talk, then that will be an opportunity for you to put it on. It is a rare privilege for us to offer a webinar with Dr. Rowan Williams on Christian faith and the renewal of politics with a special reference to Fratelli Tutti, Pope Francis's latest and cyclical. From the audience point of view, one of the benefits of having grown is you always listen something profound. From the organizer's point of view, you don't need to worry about the audience. Get him on the flyer and people will be queuing up to register. And I apologize at this stage for those people who were not able to offer to join us because of the limited space available. But you will be able to listen to Dr. Williams' lecture afterwards on St. Edmund's Church YouTube channel. And lastly, from the moderator's perspective, what I'm doing here today, you don't need to worry about the introduction. But needs to be a little careful. Do not 
hang around too long between him and you. Let us welcome on the screen a great gift from Wales to the world and the church, Dr. Rowan Williams, former Archbishop of Canterbury. Rana, thank you so much for your invitation to speak and for your warm words of welcome. It's a very great delight to be with you and to be speaking to what I gather is a very varied audience this afternoon. It's a great shame that we can't be doing this literally in Krakow, one of my favorite places in Wales, but I shall think of it. It'll be in my imagination as I speak and I feel very warmly towards it. As Rana has said, we're at the moment globally in a very unusual and rather disturbing political situation. The values of democracy, the civility that goes with democracy, the possibilities of genuine dialogue and cooperation in society, all these seem to be getting undermined in various ways. And the terrible irony is that they're being undermined at just the moment when we could do with more robust and more imaginative ways of international cooperation. As many people have pointed out, the crises we typically face at this point are not local. The COVID pandemic has already shown us just how much we are interwoven with the lives of the global community. But that, of course, is a lesson we should already have learned from the growing intensity and urgency of the environmental crisis. So it's a time when we badly need some hard thinking and some generous imagining about our politics. The church ought to be in the forefront of providing that generous, careful, inspiring, renewing vision. And I think one of the measures of the church's fidelity in this difficult period as we look back on it will be the degree to which the church has been able to step out and offer that kind of vision and that kind of hope for wider society. Now, just a few weeks ago, Pope Francis issued his encyclical Fratelli Tutti. And this is very much a response to the kind of issues that I've already outlined. It builds on his previous encyclical Laudatosi on the environmental crisis and I would argue it builds on some much deeper roots as well more of that in a moment and so this afternoon what I've chosen to do is to take you through a few of the themes of this very substantial encyclical it's really a small book just to see what kind of analysis or diagnosis Pope Francis has to offer of our current situation and where he thinks the significant pressure points are where we might bring about change. So a word about the background of this encyclical. It's the third major public pronouncement that Pope Francis has made. His first big global declaration Evangelii Gaudium was about the joy of sharing the gospel. A very vigorous, very forward-looking account of what we needed to do to persuade the world around that we really had good news to share. But on the back of this, the encyclical Laudato Si, a few years ago, was, in many people's eyes, the most significant comment made by any religious leader on the environmental crisis. Very significantly, Pope Francis took the title of that encyclical from the famous hymn of St. Francis, the hymn which we still sing as all creatures of our God and King. And in Laudato Si, Pope Francis spelled out the urgency and the complexity of the environmental crisis we faced and the reasons why Christians should be stepping up to the plate in response. 
One of the points he made there almost in passing was that if our relationship with the world around, with our environment, is as distorted and destructive as it currently seems to be, this probably suggests that there is a lot of distortion and destructiveness in our own relations with one another. And one of the undercurrents of the encyclical was, if we are to be at peace with our environment, we need to be at peace with one another. If we are to be at peace with one another, we need to be at peace with our environment. And for both, we need to be at peace with our creator. It's an insight that we already find in the words of Bishop Thomas Ken's famous evening hymn, Glory to Thee, My God, This Night, where we pray as we go to sleep that with the world, myself and thee, I ere I sleep at peace may be. Which is quite a good summary, I think, of, what's, of what Pope Francis is saying. Now in this recent encyclical, Fratelli Tutti, brothers all, literally, he again begins with a phrase of St. Francis himself. The fact that the Pope took the name of Francis was, of course, a deeply significant message. He wanted, like St. Francis, to stand not with inherited forms of hierarchy and power, but to stand with those who had no influence, those who were outcast. And in many aspects of his ministry, he has shown his awareness of that priority. But here in the encyclical, he sets that out at length and in some detail. And he makes it very clear early on in the document that he's addressing not just Christians, but the wider world. He says, it's in um, the sixth paragraph of the encyclical, that he's looking to address not just a Christian audience, but all those who are anxious and also hopeful about our political situation. It's a kind of warning as we start reading the text that this is not just going to be a sermon for the choir, as they say. And it's only quite late on in the encyclical that he comes to talk directly about Christ and the church. And one or two commentators have scratched their heads a bit about that. But the Pope is quite clear about what he's doing here. He wants, just like his great predecessor, Pope Paul VI, and his predecessor, Pope John XXIII, he wants to speak to all people of goodwill. And once again, the Pope is deliberately echoing the language of those great popes of an earlier generation who turned away simply from the, the internal business of the church to address issues affecting the well-being of the human race. So you can see that this encyclical builds on the insights of the earlier document about the environment, and behind both of them stands that first great declaration about the joy of sharing the gospel. And as we'll see, it's also true that although Pope Francis is often seen, and understandably so, as a very different character from his predecessor, Pope Benedict, in many, many respects, in all these documents, he is building on the insights of Pope Benedict, especially the three great encyclicals that Pope Benedict wrote on faith, hope, and love. So, with that in mind as the general framework, let me pick out a few of the themes that the Pope is putting before us, beginning with his diagnosis of our problems at the moment. He speaks of the many difficulties that arise in a globalized world and economy. We are connected to one another more closely, more immediately than ever before. And yet our connectedness has not so far produced a real solidarity. He sums it up very crisply by saying, we may be neighbors, but we're not brothers and sisters. In other words, we're aware of other human beings' proximity to us. What we haven't really discovered is our kinship, our real presence with them as part of one family. 
So he's addressing the global cultural situation in which communication is apparently more abundant than ever before, but understanding, compassion, and solidarity are more rare than before. A very strange, rather disturbing position to be in. As a result of this, at several points in the encyclical, Pope Francis returns to the question of how you balance global society and local identity. We have, he's saying, the wrong sorts of global identity. The global communication of the internet, which doesn't do much for anybody's blood pressure on, or morals. We have the global reality of international finance, where huge, unimaginably huge sums of capital migrate from country to country, looking for the cheapest place to settle. And we don't have a sense of sharing problems together, feeling in our own flesh and blood, the pain, the pinch of other people's need. But let's be careful here. To look for a real effective global community, which is certainly what we need, doesn't mean we have to let go of our identity and our commitment to the local. We need to be grateful, appreciative of where we are, who we're with, where our roots are. The last thing we need is, as the Pope says, a kind of abstract universality. Nobody, you might say, nobody is just a human being. Each one of us has a multitude of identities. We may be members of one particular national group or language group. We may be Welsh-speaking Welsh men and women. We may be Finns, Tanzanians, or Singaporeans. But there's more than that. We have our networks of professional contact. We have our families and our family responsibilities. We have our personal passions and concerns. Each one of these is part of our identity. And all of that identity is what is drawn into the global exchange, the global labor of building together a community where everyone may feel secure and at home. So the last thing we ought to be doing is trying to pull up our roots or deny who we are, deny our language, our family affiliations, our distinctive personal interests and all the rest of it. We are made to be different and that difference is a matter of gift and service to one another. So that another of the great themes that comes through in the Pope's encyclical is that sense of being grateful for difference. This comes out very clearly when the Pope addresses the question of migration. He doesn't have any magical solution to the pressing problems of migrants in our world. He doesn't suggest any figures for optimal number of migrants or refugees received into any one country, but he does address the very crucial question of what our attitude should be. Are we willing to see the newcomer, the stranger, the migrant as a gift and not as a threat? This doesn't immediately solve the practical questions, but it gives us a base on which to work, a base which is more deeply in accord with the gospel of welcome and hospitality than a pervasive attitude of nervousness, anxiety about the stranger. So he's encouraging us to affirm who we are and where we are, to be grateful, even proud of our local identities, but to see those identities as something that need to be opened up and woven in to the identities of others. 
it's a theme which he addresses in a rather different way when he comes rather later on in the document to talk about the nature and the ethics of private property. It's very much part of traditional Catholic social teaching to affirm that private property is a natural right for human beings. And Pope Francis says, indeed it is, but it's a secondary issue. Our first duty is to put ourselves at the service of our neighbor's well-being and flourishing. Each one of us is here to secure the happiness of others. And that great virtuous circle of looking out for one another's well-being is what makes a healthy society. And indeed, I would add, though it's something that the Pope doesn't draw out in great detail, that that is precisely the vision of human society that's laid out in the letters of St. Paul when he writes about the nature of the body of Christ. Each one of us is there to look out for the well-being of the neighbour. Each one of us has something for the neighbour that is absolutely distinctive and unique as a gift from us to them. So we need to affirm where we're coming from to know the gifts we have to share, to be willing to share them, and to be ready to receive the gifts of others. So we mustn't think that in this document, Pope Francis is trying to advance the case for some kind of world government or for some kind of homogeneous identity among human beings which takes no account of our particular situation and gifts. He's asking us to be more self-aware of the gifts we have and of how they're to be shared. Because the property that is ours to administer, to look after, is always there, not for the good of the individual, but for the good of the whole community. That's why he says that the right to private property is secondary. It's not that first and foremost, every one of us has the right to private property. It's much more that God gives to each one of us the freedom to dispose of certain gifts that are ours for the general good. So far then, I've concentrated on what Pope Francis has to say about what you might call true and false universal vision. A false universal vision is one where our solidarity, our unity with other human beings is a bare formal matter. We're all human and the differences between us just don't matter very much. And the result of that is a globalized economy where capital moves around at great speed from one area to another, where working populations with very little control over their circumstances are also encouraged to be mobile and flexible, not in a way that serves their interests very clearly. So he's looking at the search for and the struggle for a true global identity, which is an awareness, a grateful and welcoming awareness of difference and a readiness to put our resources at the disposal for the well-being of the neighbour. We're not just, he says at one point, we're not just associates in the world. We are neighbours and we're not just neighbours. We are fratelli. We are brothers and sisters. So he's resisting that abstract picture of global society, asking us for a real imaginative engagement. And just before moving on, there's one more point which he makes in this connection, which is well worth underlining at the moment. He notes that one of our problems at present is the rise of what's often called populist politics. Political leaders who appeal to the solidarity of a single racial group or national group, usually at the expense of outsiders and foreigners. Populist rhetoric has swept across many countries. We've seen how it works in the United States. And we can see it also in Hungary or in Poland, indeed at the moment in Turkey also. And the characteristic of 
populism here is to set up a kind of myth of national identity, timeless, pure national identity, which is always threatened by neighbors, undermined by strangers. The Pope refers back here to an interview he gave some years ago, where he said that the idea of the people is not a logical category, nor a mystical one. It's not an absolute given sent from heaven. National identities shift, adjust, grow and develop across time. And we need an awareness of our own history, an honest awareness of our own history, rather than this myth of timeless, pure identity, which has to be preserved at all costs. As we've seen, this doesn't in the least mean that the Pope thinks our national identities and heritage are unimportant or unreal. But he's asking us to look at them with clarity and honesty, looking at the failures as well as the successes, the highs and the lows. So he's warning us against abstract universality a global community that has no particular local differences. He's also warning us against a local populism that you might almost say deifies or idolizes a mythical national identity. Well, let's stay with that question of looking at the past and owning your identity for a moment. Because part of the Pope's diagnosis is a very important and very striking insight about our current society. He says two things are very much in evidence these days. We've lost a great deal of historical perspective in our public language, and therefore the words we use very often lose their depth and lose their full meaning. We've grown up, most of us, in a society where the passage of time, patience, taking your time, has become unpopular. We like to have what we want promptly. We don't like to think we're under the dead hand of the past. And one of the great myths of the modern age is that we have thrown off the shackles of history and therefore can forget it. But, says the Pope, it's very important to know that we have inherited wisdom, perspective, resources. We don't just have to repeat the past, that would be a very serious mistake. We do have to be aware of it and to know how we can build it. And again, to press that point a little bit further, some have said that one of the most important things we can do in our present society is remind ourselves that it's taken all of us time to get to where we are. We have learned to be the people we are. We have developed and grown into the perspectives and attitudes we share. And we need to understand something of how we got here. So that we don't just think that our position is so obvious that we never needed to learn it. And that, when we're doing it with proper intelligence and awareness. That is one way of restoring something of the depth and the resonance of the words we use. The point the Pope is making is, is really this. We throw around words like freedom and democracy and rights, thinking we know exactly what we mean by them. More and more these words become rather empty. Who knows now what exactly democracy really means? And yet it's such a crucially important notion that to go back and see how we learned to use that language, what was meant by it, how it was explored and refined, that's how we put some substance back into the word. And the same with words like freedom or notions like human rights. We need to see how we got here. We need to go over again how we learn to see things in this way. And that gives a more three-dimensional flavor to the language we use. Otherwise, we're just throwing slogans at each other as if they were peanuts. 
not quite what the purpose is, but I paraphrase. So he's asking us to be conscious of our history, conscious of our identity, asking us to look into the depths of the words we use and the ideas we take for granted, and to approach the stranger, the other, with an expectation of welcome. Now, he focuses a lot of his attention early in the encyclical on a long discussion of Jesus's parable of the Good Samaritan. He uses it as well he might as a story about the kind of generosity that overcomes the fear of the stranger. It doesn't step back from active involvement because of nervousness and anxiety about being at risk. He uses it also as a reminder of the way in which certain ideas about religious dignity, exclusivity, and duty can stand in the way of a spontaneous response. Because, of course, the first two people who walk past the wounded man on the road are religious professionals. But he develops this a bit further, noting that in the parable of the Good Samaritan, what is most clear is that the Samaritan who stops is fully and intelligently concerned for the well-being of the wounded man. He's not just doing a duty, he wants to be there alongside the wounded man he wants that person's well-being. And the Pope underlines very strongly that idea that our wanting, our passion for the well-being of the neighbour is crucial to a working world. We're not just doing our duty and we're not just engaged in what you might call damage limitation. The Latin word from which we have our word benevolence Benevolentia literally means good willing. We want the good. And for the Pope, our growth as spiritual beings is our growth in the freedom truly and passionately to want the good of the neighbour. Not to want to keep God happy by keeping the rules, not to want to do our duty, not to want to limit our risk, but to want the neighbour to be well, to be happy, to flourish. What we should be interested in, if we're concerned about the spiritual formation of Christian believers, is how we grow gradually into a deeper and stronger wanting. Now, there are many more things in the encyclical which the Pope underlines. But I'll mention just a few of the specific practical things which he draws in to his discussion, just to illustrate some of what he says, and to illustrate also some of the very pungent ways in which he can speak about some issues. He speaks about the danger in modern society of what he calls reducing ethics and politics to physics. Now, what does he mean by that? I think what he's saying is that we're in danger when we think of our social and public life. We're in danger of thinking the problem is just to balance out the forces, to keep things stable. But that's physics. It's not ethics and politics. It's not much to do with joy and flourishing. And just as in his earlier two encyclicals, the Pope is concerned that a Christian ethic is an ethic of joy, the bringing of joy to the neighbour and so to ourselves. So we have to be aware of that reduction of ethics and politics to physics. There's a similar very pungent comment and quite early in the document where he speaks of the mafioso elements in modern politics. Anyone who's spent any time in Italy will know something of what the word means. 
but the, the mafia style of government in which what matters is the security and status of the leader and everything else falls into place around that. Not entirely unfamiliar if we look around the politics of the world today. And the Pope is very clear and very sharp in naming that as a problem. It's a politics which has no concern, no passion, no will for the good of the community, but is essentially about status, protection, and the security of those who already have power. Another phrase that struck me very forcibly reading the document is where he talks about not only migrants and refugees, but about people who are exiles within our own society. A very interesting phrase that. Think, he says, of those people who are certainly in some sense in our society, but who are held back from full participation in various ways. Think of those living with disabilities. Think of the elderly, those confined to their houses. There are many categories of people who are exiles among us. They're shut out from the securities that we take for granted. And although they may have equality before the law, they may have social services to look after them, their real inclusion, their coming in or coming back from exile, is a matter, he says, of fraternity. That is, of the solidarity, the deep sense of family unity that belongs to a really fully working society. And I found myself coming away from the text with some very sharp questions in my mind about those who are exiles among us. He speaks too of the ways in which new forms of poverty and new forms of slavery are being generated all the time. We think we've overcome slavery in the classic sense but as most of us are painfully well aware these days, new styles, new forms of slavery seem to be arising all the time. You see how indentured laborers, trafficked women, all sorts of other categories of people are in effect the slaves of our own day. And there's more and more work being done on the different kinds of slavery that exist present. People who may not be literally owned by others, as the slaves of earlier generations were, but people whose liberty of movement and decision is totally confined by their conditions of employment, by the abuse they suffer because of gender or status or orientation. And these people are the new slaves. And in a very mobile global economy, very often these new forms of slavery and poverty are directly generated by the pressures of the global economy. Before finishing, I want to touch on just two further themes in Pope Francis's encyclical, which seem to me of very, very broad significance indeed. One is to do with the section where he looks at the question of democracy and the rule of the majority. He's very clear here that the rule of the majority doesn't actually alter what's right and wrong. And therefore the rule of the majority doesn't mean that the minority has no role, no right, no liberty. Democracy is about minorities as well as majorities. Democracy is about keeping alive the kind of debate and exchange that will allow people to learn from one another and hopefully to learn more of the truth from one another. But if we were to say that a majority vote decided what was right for good and all, we would be in deep trouble. There would be no long-term assurance of the rights and dignities of human beings. Essentially, we'd be back to the darkest days of the 20th century. In Central Europe, the days of the Third Reich, 
where a majority could vote into power, someone who regarded minorities, Jews, disabled people, and many others as having no rights whatsoever. The majority vote had settled the ethics, and that can't be right. And in this respect, as I hinted earlier, Pope Francis is actually building on some of the insights of Pope Benedict. But Benedict was always very clear that relativism about ethics was a dangerous ally. We mustn't imagine if we stress the importance of dialogue and the importance of understanding one another, we mustn't therefore say, well, your truth and my truth are just guesses and it doesn't really matter which is true. No, we should care about the truth. We should argue as if it mattered. At the same time, arguing as if it mattered means precisely giving the other person freedom to argue. We don't silence minorities. And our care for the truth is something which ought to underline for us as strongly as possible the real, irremovable, non-negotiable dignity of whoever it is we're talking to. No relativism about that. So there's quite a challenge there about how we hold to a vision of the truth about human beings while also living in a style that is receptive and patient and open to dialogue, what the Pope calls an open world. The point he's making is that a commitment to openness is not a commitment to relativism. To be open means to be confident in one's own vision of the truth, confident enough to go and talk about it, argue about it, put it out there in the marketplace of ideas and take the risks that go with that. And the final point I wanted to draw out is one which he comes to quite late on in the document. And that's to do with the nature of truth and reconciliation. Understandably, he quotes from documents by the bishops of South Africa, where, of course, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was such a very significant part of the generation that followed after the fall of apartheid. And the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, a brilliant and visionary idea, was also one which repeatedly ran into the sands and produced results that were not to everybody's taste. But what the Pope says is, we are committed as Christian believers to forgiveness, that we're not committed to forgetting. We have to be always on the front foot in seeking for reconciliation. And that doesn't mean that we never challenge or hold people to account. The culture of forgiveness is not a culture of impunity. He has a lot to say about this, and it's expressed with some passion. He wants, I think, to tread the very difficult line between saying we are always obliged to seek reconciliation and to avoid the, the temptation of saying, well, reconciliation ought to be easy if people would just not stand on their rights so much and back off. No, that's not it. We have to defend our rights and the rights of our neighbours, yes. We have to call people to account for what they've done, yes. But we have to do it with a vision in mind, a vision of genuine coming together and healing. And here, to my great delight, he refers to an idea which is important in some of the work of St. Augustine in the beginning of the fifth century. Augustine says that in an oppressive society, the oppressor is damaging not only others, but themselves. And to overthrow oppression and injustice is not just for the good of the oppressed, it's for the good of the oppressor. We want to liberate the oppressor from the prison of their own corrupt, destructive behavior. 
that's why challenge is important. And that's why criticism of resistance to power wrongly exercised can be an act of genuine love. Not just an act of judgment or condemnation, but an act of genuine love. Very difficult indeed, because for most of us, the great satisfaction of condemning others, even of resisting injustice, is knowing we're right and they're wrong. And to see that in terms of a longer process of the healing of the wrongdoer, the oppressor, not just the overturning of injustice, that's a very hard thing. But I believe the Pope is right to say that that is one of the distinctive Christian perspectives we bring to bear in politics and social life. Well, as I said earlier, the encyclical is a substantial document. It's a short book. And all I've been able to do this afternoon is to give you a very sketchy summary of a few of what seem to me to be the most powerful and challenging themes in this document. As I noted, at the very beginning, the Pope makes it clear that he's trying to address as wide an audience as possible. And it's interesting that at several points in this document, he refers to the text which he agreed with the Grand Imam of the Al-Azhar Mosque in Egypt, al -Tayyab, the Imam al -Tayyab. He wants to say that there is a genuine interfaith perspective here. He's coming at this quite clearly as a Christian theologian whose inspiration is the gospel of Jesus Christ. At the same time, he wants us to recall that there are many areas of this vision in which we can quite rightly and reasonably stand alongside people in other religious traditions. And that seems to me a decision about how he writes, which is very significant, that he wants to go on making reference to this shared vision, not an exclusively Christian one. It is a document which finally comes round to talking a good deal about Christ and Christ's church. And it would be wrong to say, although as I've said, some have hinted at it, it would be wrong to say that his desire to reach a wider audience has muted his interest in the distinctiveness of the Christian gospel. But he's looking for a vision that can genuinely inspire a new generation. He's looking for ways of identifying the major problems and crises that are faced in our current political world. And to find those strands and elements in the Christian gospel and in Christian theology, which will most effectively speak into the crises of our day. It's a bold, far-reaching document. Sometimes, like any such document, the reader will feel this is vague, idealistic, and general. I don't quite know what I'm meant to do about this. Sometimes he will offer accounts of other positions that are rather thin or unconvincing. One or two people have said what, what he claims about the defense the moral defense of capitalism is actually not something anybody very much really argues for. But when all that's said and done, I believe that this encyclical is a profoundly significant document for the whole Christian world. It's a document in which the leader of the largest of the Christian bodies in the globe sets out a picture of how society could and should work for the well-being of all. And he identifies all those things which hold us back from that kind of generous, mutual, confident and secure society. He touches in passing on the fact that since he started writing it, we've been through the COVID pandemic. And he stresses the fact that we've been reminded of our insecurity and our interdependence in this process, themes which will come again and again in this text. To end then with his central insight. We may be 
neighbors in a rather formal sense across the world, but we're not yet brothers and sisters. And even being a neighbor is more than being just an associate. We need to recover that sense of real responsibility for one another. A sense of responsibility that belongs in any well-functioning family. We need to feel the need, the failure and the suffering of the other, our problem, our challenge. We need, therefore, with St. Francis of Assisi, the Pope's patron saint, we need to become fratelli tutti. We need all to be genuinely brothers and sisters in our world. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Dr. Rowan Williams, for this very thought-provoking lecture. Great circle of looking one another makes this world a better place to live. We are not just associated to one another, but we are neighbors, and our journey is to become brothers and sisters to one another. My well-being depends on the well-being of my neighbor. We need to help those who are in kind of self-exile in their own societies. We also need to help those who have enslaved themselves in the prisons of oppression and injustice. There is an opportunity for you to ask questions. You might have seen, and I can see some of you have already sent questions to using this little bar at the bottom of your screen, where it says Q&A. Um, Dr. Rogan can see these questions too. I'm sure there are three questions um, and a few more coming in. People have asked, uh, we will be taking them by, one by one. Uh, the first question is asked uh, by a friend from Malta. Is there a danger of giving too much to Caesar and not little to God? Church leaders doing too much political lobbying, too little Christian witness of service, and welcome the marginalized communities, home and abroad, and strangers. Thank you. Um, two points in response to that. Thank you, Cameron. Um, first of all, lobbying alone, of course, is not enough. And I, I'm really painfully aware of how easy it is to become just a, um, as they say, a, a rent a quote. You, know, you, you make statements about big public issues um, to annoy governments, and that becomes an end in itself. No, of course, we should be we should be doing the work. We should be there on the front line welcoming. And I was deeply moved a couple of years ago when the first um, unaccompanied children from the Calais camps were allowed into Britain. I was down in Croydon with a group to meet some of these people and a large crowd of local church people had turned up carrying banners saying, you're welcome to the UK and providing, frankly, more more food and welcoming things than, than we could really cope with that day. So it can be done and it should be done. So that's the first thing. Of course, lobbying alone isn't enough. But one of the points the Pope touches on in the encyclical is that there's more than one kind of love. It's loving to share food with the neighbor. But perhaps the, the political form of love is we should have a government which helps me to have the kind of job which enables me to share food with the neighbor. That's love as well. So lobbying politicians, lobbying public figures, trying to shift um, the views of government isn't a waste of time or a turning away from the imperatives of God. We're trying, I suppose, to help the politician act lovingly in a political way, which means creating the conditions in which you and I can more effectively share with one another. Um, somebody said, I can't remember who it was, that um, one of the aims of Christians in politics was to try and create a society where it was a little bit easier to be good. <laughs> that's, 
that's an interesting thought to, to play with. Thank you very much. I'm sure uh, Cameron is much satisfied with this answer. Uh, we have another question asked by Anthony State Fallon, uh, who was uh, one of the most senior judges in Wales. And now it's a privilege to have him a trader of St. Edmund's Church in Crickhowell. Uh, Anthony's question is, in countries where the public media are predominantly given to secular matters and entertainment, how is your experience? Do faith communities gain access to the media to communicate their values and principles? Thank you very much indeed. Um, it's a very searching and difficult question. I wish there were a simple answer to it, I must say. Um, it's certainly true that most of the media is increasingly indifferent to religious matters and tends to look at the churches simply as a source for variously titillating or scandalous stories and unfortunately we're quite capable of producing those for people. How do we break through that? Sometimes it's a matter of a thought, what I call a thoughtful dramatic gesture. Most of us remember, don't we, the moment when um, Archbishop John Centenary, then Archbishop of York, interviewed on the Andrew Marr show, uh, cut up his clerical collar on television, um, saying that he wouldn't wear a collar again until Robert Mugabe had ceased to be the ruler of Zimbabwe. And you know, people remember that. And I'm not suggesting that we should all go around cutting up our collars or whatever, whatever else, but thinking about the surprising gesture, the surprising moment. I think that does a great deal. We have to think around the media. We're not going to capture the high ground. We have to think how we will find those moments, those dramatic public gestures. We also have to look at what we can do ourselves in terms of open communication, opening up our own church environments, our own internal discussions and reflections through social media and in other ways. And I think it's an interesting um, re reflection to pursue. I think that these last few difficult months of largely working as churches online, that's done something for us in making the life of the church a little bit more accessible to people who wouldn't otherwise have encountered it. I was very interested by the statistic that I think well over 20% of the British population had tuned into some form of online worship or whatever during the period of lockdown. So there are, there are maybe lessons to be learned there. But as I say, we're not going to recapture mainstream media overnight and shouldn't expect to. It's deeply frustrating but it's not wholly impossible that we can create some new publics through online media. And it's still the case that where you have an unusual, remarkable person like Archbishop Sentimu, um, people will find the gesture, the sign that will break through and say something fresh to people. And that's, that's it because a lot of people are both uninterested in religion and confident that they know what religion is all about. Just occasionally when a figure appears who can genuinely interest them and genuinely make them think, oh, so that's what it's about and I didn't realize it, then something actually begins to come together. And the last point on that is, of course, something which will be very familiar to all of you. You begin at the local level. You begin with telling the stories, raising the banner of witness, where you are. It's still the case, social media or notion of social media, that people will recognize effective flesh and blood signs on their doorstep. They will respond and recognize in many ways to that. And there are still opportunities there. Not a very good answer, I'm afraid, I, because I don't have a, a brilliant solution. 
I worry about it constantly, but we keep trying. Thank you very much. Uh, we have another question uh, asked by Dr. Richard Howell, uh, who is one of the leaders of the Evangelical Federation in North India uh, and director of Cable Institute. Uh, he asks, uh, and how much, uh, first of all, he how much appreciate what you have said, but how can we address rise of major major majoritarian rule and views all over the world? Hmm. Thank you very much, Richard. It's, uh, it's something which we ought to be deeply concerned about. I was looking just a couple of days ago at a book on um, American religion at the moment, which is a, a rich source for research and reflection. Um, and the author of this book was saying, the fact is that in a good many local Christian communities, there will be genuine differences of opinion. She says in her, in her experience, there are relatively few 100% red or 100% blue churches, because red and blue in the States mean the opposite to what they do in the UK. But, um, and she says that most of them become a sort of purple color. They, they bleed into each other because people have to work at the local level in finding solutions that everybody can live with. And they may not be your ideal solution or my ideal solution, but they're a solution we can all just about cope. And the hard work of doing that is where the real democratic skills are forged. So I think that the more we are involved with negotiating, talking with, listening to one another at that local level and finding those ways forward, the more we undermine the idea that the ideal situation is just winners and losers. We have to get beyond that, that model, as if politics was simply about winning and losing. And if you lose, you lose, that's it. And you're out. Until perhaps next time around when you win and then the others will lose. And, aha, <laughs> you've, you've done it. Somehow we have to focus on those longer term things which we will all need. And that's what's so frustrating in the world of majoritarian politics and zero-sum politics. There are some goals which we all need. We all need secure food supplies. We all need clean water. We all need health services. We all need a safety net in times of distress or accident or unexpected disaster. We all need those things. And it's not that providing them or securing them is a party matter. We've got to find ways of securing these things for all, because otherwise people's lack of investment in and trust in their own society itself becomes destructive. And for any majoritarian, anyone who thinks it's all about majority rule, you have to ask the question, so how do you make sure that the minority retain their feeling that they can trust the society they're in. How do we build trust for everyone? It's a long job. And wherever you turn in the world at the moment, you see people who apparently are ignoring those, those concerns. But more than ever, it's for Christians to stand up and say, well, every person is precious in the sight of God. Every person is summoned by the call of Christ, every person is taken with utter seriousness by their maker and redeemer. Um, and a pure majoritarianism just can't cope with that. The loser and the winner still stand together before God, and they still have things which they need to help one another secure and guarantee for the common good. Thank you very much. I know we have um, a limited time, but we can take uh, another question. Uh, if you will be kind enough to answer these questions. The question is about uh, Christian motherhood. I know uh, you have been talking about uh, fraternity, brothers all, but the question is about we are divided as Christians on the core issues. 
how can we make united struggle to stand unite on issues which are very sensitive and can raise many questions being Christians? Hmm. Thank you. Um, well, I wonder, I wonder what we regard as core issues and why some core issues seem to matter more than others. Of course, Christians are divided on many things, as, we, as we've all noticed. We're divided, um, of course, in our own Anglican church, we're divided on issues of sexuality. It's been a, a long and bitter debate. Um, issues around abortion in the United States are really very much a litmus test for Christian identity and solidarity. And I don't want in the least to minimize the importance of either, either of those issues. But is there something beyond that that we can talk about? This is where I go back, surprise, surprise, I go back simply to the Bible. What does the New Testament tell us about who we are and where we are? The New Testament tells us that the death and resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth has brought into being a new community which is potentially a context where every single creature of God can be at home with one another because their destructiveness, their sin, the downward spiral of selfishness has been arrested, the, the debt has been paid, the toxic inheritance of selfishness has been broken by the death and resurrection of Jesus and we're now by the gift of the Spirit set free to serve one another. That is the great new thing about the Christian gospel. That is what God has given to the world in Jesus Christ. And it seems to me that there ought to be some level at which we can say that new creation is what we're struggling to present to people, struggling to share. Within that, yes, of course, we, we disagree about the interpretation of some things. Christians, remember, have disagreed for centuries about whether it's legitimate to go to war. They've disagreed about some aspects of the use of money. And it's interesting, by the way, that in the encyclical, the Pope has some quite tough things to say about war in the modern world and some very, very tough things to say about the use of the death penalty, which is a very new thing for a pope to talk about in these terms. It's not as if we've only now in this century begun to experience deep and sometimes bitter division. But can we think of the gift that we've been given, the inexpressible gift of the new creation in Christ's spirit? Can we speak first and foremost about, well, back to Pope Francis, Evangelii Gaudium, the joy of the good news. Can we speak about the promise of a universal community where everyone is ransomed, healed, restored, forgiven, and fully at home with one another? If that's the center, there will be issues around the edges that may be very messy, very difficult to cope with. They will produce, they do produce, lots of tensions, lots of suffering. And yet, God continues to act and God continues to call. God is not silenced. Can we try to listen to God's call and to let it echo in us? Because when that happens, surprising results do follow. And I've been moved beyond words at times when I've seen how Christians of very different traditions have been able to come together in witness in this sort of area. I'm thinking, and it, it's not a, a unique example, but I'm thinking of the way in which in the time where I've been living for the last few years, the local food bank, the city food bank, was an initiative which came from one of the big Roman Catholic parishes, one of the big free evangelical churches, and an evangelical Anglican parish church. 
they would have disagreed about quite a lot of issues, to put it mildly. And they're supported by people from other churches who would disagree even more. And yet, they were doing something in the name of the new creation. Thank you very much. Uh, there are a few other questions. Uh, I think uh, the nature of these questions uh, um, have already been answered through other comments and questions you mentioned. Um, uh, but one comment which just arrived, I would just like to mention, is the church needs to speak out in the political world. My but its voice seems badly muted at the present time in our national life. Yes, um, I just want to say, I think it is extremely important that the church speaks for the vision of the kingdom. The church doesn't have a right to decide for society, doesn't even have a, a sacred right to go and intervene in politics, but it has a duty, it has a call to witness, to say, in the face of any injustice, any confusion, it really doesn't have to be like this. We have been given a gift which God wants to share through us. And to say that is not, I think, the church interfering in politics, it's the church witnessing to the kingdom. And again and again in recent history, that's where the church has been most itself when it's stepped forward to speak on behalf of the kingdom, which means speaking on behalf of those who are forgotten, the internal exiles that the Pope talks about. And I just hope and pray that we go on finding the courage and resource to, to do that without fear. Thank you very much. Um, I know people are uh, sending messages uh, on my WhatsApp and email too. Uh, some of you mm, are not finding it easy to send the questions through Q and A uh, bar at the bottom of your um, your bottom of your screen. Uh, but Dr. Williams, if you could briefly respond to one of the questions which just have been asked by Ian Blake. You mentioned words needing to recover their debts. You spoke about democracy. Would you like to say a bit more about freedom and right? Mm. Thank you very much, Ian. Um, well, here, here goes with the risk of another lecture, but <laughs> I'll say a few words briefly. The root of it all, I think, for a Christian is the notion that every human being bears the image of God. Every human being, therefore, is a center of love and intelligence and relationship. And for any human being to be the human being they need to be, their capacity for love and intelligence and relationship has to be released. All that we say about human rights, I think, flows from that. Human rights isn't a matter of coming into the world with a kind of charter of entitlements. The essence of any language about human rights is that we come into the world bearing that dignity and that capacity to love, to understand, to relate. And to work for human rights is to keep our eyes open wherever we turn in the world for those systems and those practices those forms of government, those forms of power, which stifle people's freedom to love and understand and relate. And that's why a Christian is quite properly concerned about the freedom for education and the right kind of education, properly concerned for good local democracy, good participatory democracy at grassroots level, concerned about the position of those who've historically been shut out from a share in things, and who still are concerned about the position of women, or those who have disabilities, and so on. So I would approach this very much on the basis of human rights as a way of talking about what is due to human beings as the image of God. Now, one of the things which follows from that, I think, is that 
every human being's perspective, if they're capable of love and intelligence and relationship, every human being's perspective is worth listening to and worth taking seriously. And that is the foundation of popular democracy. We, we have systems of universal voting on the basis that essentially, yes, everybody's voice is worth listening to. And if everybody's voice is worth listening to, then to go back to what I was saying earlier, the voices of the minority as well as the majority are worth listening to. And so you come to a certain kind of representative democracy as you know, a, a rough approximation of what I think the gospel requires of us in terms of the service of our neighbor. It doesn't mean that any one democratic system falls from heaven. It does mean that there are things about our democratic practice which do quite properly reflect a sort of theological background and we should be clear about that and not ashamed or um, backward in reminding of our society of these deep religious roots of democratic practice. But democracy at the moment is, is a word which so often just seems to refer to a game we play in which some people win. And it's so much more than that, if fully understood in the connection with the context of human rights and dignities, the rights and dignities belonging to people made in God's image. Thank you so much for this very thought-provoking talk and uh, with patience answering all the questions which further has touched on various issues which we all can explore further. And thank you very much for you all for joining us. If you would like to listen what Dr. Rowan William is preaching tomorrow on the Feast of Christ the King, you are welcome to join us for our online service at St. Catherine Ministry area. Please go to St. Edmunds Church Creek Howell's website and you will find the link there. I'm so much thankful for time enlarged and without him, this webinar was not possible for his technical assistance and support. Eric Gawa for your contribution and giving us background of why we are here today and all that you have been doing for the publicity of the events at the church. And a big thanks to Ross and John Matty for their tireless work for last month and so responding various emails which they have done. I think after listening to this thought provoking talk, it will be a good idea to spend a brief time in prayer. So all that we have heard, not go in waste, rather we are able to work together to create a better world for ourselves and for next generations. We thank you, Lord, for this wonderful opportunity that we have learned today, how important it is for us to live as brothers and sisters to make this world a better place. Lord, we thank you for your servant, Dr. Rowan Williams, for the wisdom that you have given him and how generously he shared it with others. Help us, Lord, all to be your true disciples. Let us, O oh Lord, as we are on our journey to explore our deeper relationships with one another and with you. We ask this in your mighty name. Amen. Thank you very much. If you are able to join us, you are most welcome to join us for our only online prayer tomorrow. And you will be able to listen Dr. Rowan Williams' sermon and wonderful worship led by our worship group.